Hey, hello, I'm Uli. I worked for New Store for a little more than a year by now. Um, just a question, because a lot of faces look familiar. Who's here for the first time? Oh, quite a few. Okay, so I don't want to say a whole lot about New Store. We provide uh, services and applications that enable mobile commerce for brand-based customers the way you want to shop these days. It's always on, it's a single touch simplicity and uh, will revolutionize the world a little bit, uh, one step at a time. And Postgres is our backbone in our AWS service-based infrastructure that's mainly written in Go and Python. On the front end side, um, we use um, different technologies like uh, JavaScript, for instance, and uh, well, a well-known Facebook framework. You can guess what the name is of that. Um, and uh, without further ado, I want to hand over to Heroku. Former from, Heroku. Uh, from, Hero from Heroku, an Amazon veteran of sorts. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so uh, really quickly, a little bit of just kind of quick background about myself. A um, couple of shameless plugs in here. Um, does everyone here use Postgres? Quick show of hands. Does anyone not? Actually, that may be easier. A couple of people. OK. So um, maybe I can convert you by the end of it, or you can suffer through for an hour. Um, so I curate Postgres weekly. If you're not subscribed, it's a weekly newsletter like Ruby Weekly and all the others. Um, go subscribe. Hopefully, it's useful to you. Um, uh, currently, actually, head of Citus Cloud. I was at Heroku up until about six weeks, two months ago. Um, spent about five years at Heroku, ran product for Heroku Postgres. We ran somewhere on the order of 1 to 1.5 million Postgres databases, so a few. Um, I launched Python support a long time ago, ran product for a bunch of their core languages and API. So can talk about Heroku if anyone has questions about that afterwards. Happy to field those. I know what it was like way back when we were small and 20 people and uh, over 200 people when I left. Um, so first, um, Postgres is getting up there as far as a database. Uh, they just had a conference in New York and celebrated a big kind of 20th birthday party for it. Um, I think if you look at a lot of databases, it, it tends to take five to 10 years. I think we were talking earlier before uh, over pizza. Like it's 10 years before a database matures. So Postgres has been there for a little while. So it's kind of the, the old one on the block. Um, it has a lot of the same roots as Oracle, as DB2, all of them coming out of kind of ingress out of UC Berkeley. Um, so this is kind of a fun email uh, from Tom Lane. Does, does anyone know who Tom Lane is? A few hands. Um, so Tom Lane basically wrote a ton of plumbing on the internet. He uh, created uh, libjpg, um, libpng, uh, co-authored uh, the spec for PNG. Um, I think he did something with TIFF way back when. And he did that for like 20 years. And then he said, OK, I've had enough of images. I'm going to go basically work on Postgres. And in any given release, he is probably 50% of a release of Postgres. Um, so a pretty prolific but kind of unknown CS person. Uh, this is an email he sent to the mailing list about 10 years ago that basically is like, we failed horribly in naming this Postgres SQL because no one knows how to pronounce it. So just go with Postgres and make the world much easier for everyone. Um, really quickly, if you need a, a quick, like, why on earth should I use Postgres, here's the, the short of it. This is like the high level of features, and this probably is missing a whole lot. Um, I'll cover some of this in my talk. Some of this I'll miss, so if you want to, like, know what something is and you don't up there, um, go look it up. Uh, a couple examples like Listen Notify. Listen Notify is awesome. It's basically pub sub in your database, because why not? Uh, window functions are great for analytics. Um, PostGIS, if you do geospatial stuff, um, Postgres is one of the best free databases out there for it. Um, it's probably even one that competes against the paid ones really, really well. All right, one more kind of intro slide before I get into it. Uh, this is a quote from a colleague, um, but I think it actually uh, positions it pretty well. Like Postgres is a data platform these days. It's no longer just a relational database. Um, it's a lot more than that. It's geospatial, it's full text search. 
um, much more like Emacs, which is everything under the sun that it doesn't need to be. Um, Postgres, I think, actually takes a pretty good approach to that. Um, but it basically, it's more of a platform now than anything else. And I think we'll see this as we get into it. So for a, a rough outline, I'm basically going to skip some of the way, way back when of Postgres and assume you're all a little bit familiar with it. Um, Postgres 9.5 was just released three months ago. Uh, Postgres 9.6 is now feature frozen as of a few weeks ago. Um, so basically, like, what did you just get in Postgres 9.5 that you maybe didn't know about, or maybe you did? Um, what's coming in uh, probably six months time frame, but we'll see. Um, there's no kind of set date for the release. It's kind of when it's ready after it gets enough beta testing. And then uh, a couple of uh, extensions. So uh, I'll get into this, but basically extensions allow you to add some extra functionality into Postgres without having to fork or have it get into the main line of Postgres. Um, so pretty powerful here. And then just a few other kind of cool things in case we have some time. So Postgres 9.5 looks something like this. Uh, we'll go ahead and just kind of dig right into it. Uh, who knows what this is? Couple of hands. Um, I bet in a minute you a lot more will know. Um, so this is a horrible name. This is the syntax for the feature. Um, this is the feature that everyone was ecstatic about in Postgres and has been asking for for probably five years now. Um, this name probably sounds a lot familiar. Um, this is super handy. It's an annoyance that MySQL had it over Postgres for the longest period of time. Um, so if you're not familiar, basically you try to insert a record. Uh, if it already exists there, um, today it would just error. So upstart is basically a create or update this record. So um, I actually struggled for a little while thinking of a good example of this, of like, okay, when would I actually need this? Um, someone posted an example of a, a pen tweet. This is a great example. I don't want to actually have to build the logic into my application and say, if they already have one, do this, and if not, go ahead and update it. Um, upstart simplifies this a lot. Basically, I can say, okay, for this user, here's the pen tweet. Uh, save it or create it, whichever. So before upsert, um, you could do something like this. Um, most people do this. It's pretty common for an application to say, do a create or update. Um, this is a CTE. We'll talk a little bit about this uh, later on. Um, basically, it tries to do it. If it has an error, then it returns an ID and go ahead and inserts a new one. Um, the problem with this is if you're doing anything under any sort of real traffic, uh, you're going to have race conditions here. Uh, it's pretty much guaranteed. Um, if you're doing something like a pinned tweet, you're probably okay, but if you're doing any large-scale application and multiple records are trying to be updated at the same time, you're going to have an issue. Um, so now this is nice and transactionally safe like we want. So uh, pretty simple syntax. Um, insert on conflict do this thing. Um, I can do nothing, actually. I can actually just say, oh, it's OK. I already have something. Just do nothing um, and not error back to me in my application. I can do an update. I can have all sorts of conditions here, pretty much what you would expect. All right, shifting a little bit to indexes. Um, this is what indexes look like in Postgres. Uh, has anyone here used more than three of these? Has anyone here even used three of them? OK, a couple of hands. Um, so if you're like me, uh, when I look at this, I am super confused. Um, it looks something like this. It's like, if you read the Postgres stocks, it doesn't actually help much. Um, a quick primer. So um, the new one in Postgres 9.5 that we'll get to is uh, Brin index, block range index. Um, but first, a little bit on the primer. Uh, if you do create index, you're just doing a B-tree index. Like, this is what we all learned in CS school. Um, a standard index just works. Nine times out of 10, this is what you want. Just create index. It's going to index the thing. It's going to work. It's going to be fine. Um, it gets more interesting if you're using uh, more creative data types. So if you're using uh, arrays or JSON or HStore or JSONB, uh, it gets a little more interesting. So um, if you're not familiar, JSONB is an awesome data type now available in Postgres. It's binary JSON directly in your database. So it is more or less what Mongo does, except for it doesn't lose your data. Um, array is a pretty cool one as well. Um, array is just an array you know, as a data type. Um, there's some really nice use cases for this. 
So with an array, uh, say tags, right? There's no reason to have a whole other table for tags uh, if you're writing a, a blog application. Like, just go ahead and throw them in an array, and it just works. Uh, the nice thing with a gen is that you can query across every single value in there. So it's going to create this index and index every single value inside of that single column. So the rule of thumb, if you've got multiple values inside a single column, a gen is usually what you want. Uh, just is another one, and gen and just can be used a little interchangeably. One has better performance characteristics, one has better uh, space on disk, it really kind of depends. Um, but this is a, a pretty accurate overgeneralization that works. So just uh, generalized uh, search tree is essentially for when you have two co a column with data that can overlap. So if you're doing like geospatial stuff, if you have two circles that could overlap, if you have full text search, so parts of uh, a sentence or word could kind of overlap with parts of another one. Um, that's the rough rule of thumb there. Um, again, gen and gist can give you slightly different uh, performance characteristics and disk space usage, but overall this works pretty well. Um, on the others, uh, KNN is used for similarity. I actually haven't found a common practical use for it, um, but basically you can find things in how similar they are. Uh, SPGIST, this is a really fun one, um, that I, I only know it's good for phone numbers. Uh, I've had Postgres core people explain it to me over and over and over, and all I know is basically if you're storing phone numbers, you use SPGIST. Um, it has to do with something where there's like some natural clustering, clustering and then things start to deviate from that. Um, and then block range indexes. Um, so block range indexes uh, are useful in a similar fashion, apparently, to SPGIST, except for when you have a ton of data. So when there's a, a massive amount of data, usually like, let's say starting at 100 gigs up to terabytes, and there's natural clustering. Um, otherwise, indexes start to be as big or bigger than your data sometimes on these sides of data sets. Um, so S, uh, brand index is kind of useful there. Uh, has anyone used uh, foreign data wrappers before? All right, just one hand. So I'll go ahead kind of into what uh, foreign data wrappers are. Uh, these are incredibly useful if you have more than one Postgres database or another type of data store. So a foreign data wrapper allows you to uh, connect from inside Postgres to some other database. Um, it could be Postgres or it could be something else. So an example of you can query from inside Postgres directly to Redis. Um, normal SQL API, you basically say, here's my Redis table, let me just query to it like it's a normal table. Um, you can do that to Mongo. Um, you still are kind of stuck with the Mongo limitations on ability to analyze, um, but you still have a native SQL interface. There's a number of foreign data wrappers. There's ones for uh, MySQL, for Oracle, for DB2. There's one for Twitter that I actually don't know what it does or why you would use it, but it exists. Um, so it's pretty simple. Uh, basically, you say create extension, um, the name of it. You create the remote server, so basically you give it a connection string. Um, and then you create the foreign table. So basically, you create a mapping from uh, my local table here, um, which is going to be my Mongo table, to this foreign table over here in Mongo. Um, and this is a little different depending on if you're working with Redis or MySQL, that kind of thing, but you kind of get the idea. Basically, I'm going to now have this uh, virtual table in Postgres that I can just query. Um, this looks pretty simple. Uh, if you use these much, you'll get super frustrated. This is like a huge pet peeve of mine, or was up until 9.5, that if I have a table with uh, 100 columns or so, I have to go and like manually declare all the data types, how they map, that sort of thing. Especially with Postgres, it's annoying, because I should be able to just do this. Uh, Postgres 9.5, and this is going to be kind of be a common theme of Postgres 9.5, rounds out a lot of these usability things. So now I can say, just take this foreign schema over here, create this, uh, take this table, and pull it directly into my local Postgres database in a mapping. Um, one command, and then no matter how many columns or whatever, it's just there. And I can query it pretty seamlessly. If, uh, if you do run like multiple Postgres databases, um, small kind of line of business, that kind of things, and you have a centralized one, that kind of thing, um, for a data warehousing purpose, this is incredibly powerful and useful. Um, so if you haven't used it and you have multiple Postgres databases and you're doing ETL between them, I'd heavily encourage you to take a look at this. All right, uh, grouping sets. 
Um, another thing that you can basically do before, but again, this becomes much easier with uh, Postgres 9.5 now. So it's really useful for analytics. When you want to cube things or kind of do uh, before what you could do with a case statement. Um, so an example here is, let's say you've got department, role, and age. Uh, and you want to find how many of these kind of collections there are. Now I can basically um, take this command right here, which says group by my grouping type, and there's all th three different ones here, and say, all right, let me just add this onto here and roll it up. Um, before, what you would have to do is a whole bunch of case statements, which is fine when you have kind of male and female or when you have five departments. But if you've got five departments and you've got uh, gender and you've got age, this becomes a really complicated query needlessly. Um, so now this is just going to automatically roll this up for you and you can say, okay, cool. Here's all of my departments and here's all the aggregates of them. Um, if you call it by grouping set, it's going to do all the individual rollups there. Uh, cube's going to do probably what you expect it and cube it every single which way you could want. So you're going to have like the full breakdown, right? The department, the, the role, the age, you're going to have drop age and have that. Then you're going to have, you know, the next role, etc. And it's basically going to have kind of every kind of combination you could want. I will leave, uh, I will leave roll up to you. You can probably guess what it does. Um, but go give it a run. Um, if you're doing any sort of analytics and rollups, these are super handy and save you a good bit of time. Um, so I talked a little bit about JSONB. Um, Postgres got a lot of hype for JSON in 9.2, probably wrongfully so. Um, if you're on Postgres 9.2 or 9.3, don't use that, Postgres, that JSON version. Um, all it does is basically do JSON validation on text and throw it into a text blob. Um, this actually isn't very performant. Um, it works, but it's, it's not great. Um, so JSONB came out, and fortunately, it at least got some hype and has more usage. Um, it is a binary representation of JSON uh, on disk. So it's really nice. You can uh, query into it. You can index on it. So I mentioned gen indexes. If you create a gen index, it's going to index on every key and every value inside the JSON document. Uh, there's some benchmarks to say, oh, how does it compare to Mongo? Um, you can search for them, pretty easy to find. Uh, in a lot of cases, it says, hey, this is actually going to be faster and more safe for your data. Um, but again, on this theme of kind of usability, rounding things out. Um, aside from upstart, there wasn't kind of a landmark feature, but we see a lot of this usability stuff come in 9.5. Um, so there's a lot of new functions. Uh, the first one is concatenation. If you were trying to concatenate two JSON documents together. This was quite annoying. You basically had to pull it out to your application and then do it. Um, if you're inserting something new, it can be kind of annoying that way. Um, so it's pretty simple. I mean, just what I would think you would expect. Basically, um, I tried to bold this. I don't know that you can see that those two lines are bolded right there. Um, let's see, will it show my mouse? No. Um, so basically, the, the two vertical lines there, right? Um, just to concatenate, just like you would a string in Postgres, um, concatenate two JSON documents together. Uh, removing keys. Uh, this one's a little bit uh, simpler um, to see, I think. Uh, basically, subtract the key, just like you would expect, nice and simple. Um, and then the next one, this is actually my favorite. If you query the JSON uh, B, it looks like a horribly run together JSON document um, in Postgres 9.4. Um, just to be able to, to have something like this as output instead of, if I go back to one of these, um, this one kind of shows it. If you see, you know, you've got age, you've got uh, name, all one big string. If you've got any sizable document, this is completely unreadable. So you could pipe this out to something like J JQ and then make it pretty. Um, but now Postgres will just do it for you. Um, so now just pretty print this and Postgres is going to give you some really nice, pretty formatted uh, JSON. So that's Postgres 9.5. Um, if you're not using it and you're running on uh, an older version, it's worth upgrading. It's a lot of nice small usability. Um, the big thing being upsert, right? Um, if you're using a custom upsert today, don't. Um, it'll create issues for you probably. Um, go ahead and get the main one. Uh, Postgres 9.6. Um, this is kind of, I think, going to be the theme for a lot of future Postgres versions, similar to 9.5, 9.6 as well. Um, there's not a huge kind of landmark feature like JSONB. 
Um, I don't see Postgres picking up any new, like, huge game changer features because they kind of has all of them already. Um, it has full text search, it has GIS. Um, now what we're getting is a little bit more on performance and then continuing to round out usability. So you'll see, um, I think, as it, like, Bloom Filter is a good example. We'll get to it in a minute. Um, the first, though, is parallel scans. So Postgres today, when you execute a query, if it uses an index scrape, um, if it doesn't use an index, it's going to sequentially scan all your data and look for things that match. Um, so it's basically going to pull all of it up in the memory, parse it, send you back some data. Uh, this is all right, um, but it does this basically on a single process. Um, so you're pretty well limited today in terms of, of scalability and performance there. Um, we have multiple cores. We have multiple processors for a reason these days. Uh, now Postgres has parallel scans. So what it's going to do is basically have multiple different uh, worker processes uh, scan this data, communicate back and forth to each other of where they're at, roughly. Um, so there's some overhead there, so it's not perfectly linear of you, you know, have five worker processes, it's going to be four times faster. But rough benchmarks do show a pretty big gain. So not quite four times, there's a little bit of coordination overhead there. Uh, but this is a pretty big game changer. Uh, this is still kind of on a single node, a single instance, but it lays a lot of the groundwork for Postgres becoming more and more parallel in the future. Uh, Bloom filters. Um, so is everyone here familiar with Bloom filters as a CS kind of notion? Okay, a few hands. Um, a really kind of short explanation. Um, essentially, they're a space-efficient probabilistic data structure. So what this means is if I have like columns uh, A, B, C, D, and E, right? Um, and I want to search for A and B. Um, today I would say, okay, I'm going to create an index on A and B. I could create individual indexes or I could create a compound index. Uh, but then if I have, um, I think a lot of like product um, filtering, you know, um, actually think of retail, right? I want to filter for this color, I want to filter for this size, that sort of thing, a bunch of different stuff. Um, I don't want to have to have an index on everything, and if I do, Postgres may or may not use it. Um, so Bloom Filter is going to basically say, create this, uh, today I would do this, uh, which I kind of walk through. Um, I would create an index on A and B, but as soon as I'm searching for C, I'm going to miss that. So what I'm probably going to do is create an index on A, B, C, D, and E, and a lot of the times Postgres is not going to use that, um, just because it's not going to be as efficient, it doesn't know how to coordinate across the two. So a, uh, a Bloom filter, what I'm going to do is create the extension Bloom now. Um, a lot of these things in Postgres you're going to see become as extensions. A lot of them are going to ship with Postgres, but be an extension that you turn on. Then I'm going to create this index on all of these columns. And what it's going to do is basically kind of know from a heuristic perspective um, what's in A, what's in B, what's in C, and what kind of meets these conditions. And the downside of it is it, it might return a few false positives. Now, this is just on the internal index piece that it's going to return false positives. As a user, you're not going to see that. So it's going to return some false positives to Postgres and say, OK, I, you know, um, in this case where I was looking for, oops, uh, maybe A is 23 and B is 785. Maybe it gets where A is 24 and B is 785. And it's going to return that to me. But then Postgres is going to do an extra scan and say, OK, I actually need to meet these conditions. So it's going to be much, much faster when you have all these kind of extra conditions that you're searching for. All right, uh, Postgres 9.6. Um, there's a number of other kind of pieces here. Um, I mentioned parallel sequential scans. Um, it also, there's parallel joints now. So the exact same thing for joins, when you're doing a join on some condition in that way. Um, these are going to be pretty big for performance on a single node of Postgres. Uh, no more table vacuums. This one, uh, if you follow Hacker News at all, this has got a lot of attention. You probably actually didn't care about this unless you're running a database with more than a terabyte of data um, that's under heavy load all the time. Um, so basically, is when Postgres um, holds a lock right now for a full table vacuum, um, a really long one, this changes it to a short-lived one so you don't have transaction wraparound during the vacuum. Um, transaction wraparound is a horrible thing. It can basically... Um, Postgres under the table is a giant append-only uh, log, and it basically recycles those IDs and goes and cleans things back up under the covers. So if it can't keep up with the volume, it can't get a new ID, which means you can't insert data. Um, so when people talk about transaction uh, wraparound, that's that. 
in this case, it only applies in a very kind of minor case around vacuum. Um, so it got a lot of attention. Most people actually will never see your benefit from this. Um, and then a number of FDW improvements. So I mentioned kind of Postgres 9.5. There's a lot of nice rounding out of features, no like landmark feature aside from upsert. Um, Postgres 9.6, parallel, all that work is really kind of the landmark there, um, which as an end user, you don't do anything different. It just kind of works for you. Um, a lot of the future of Postgres has really been coming around extensions. So PostGIS, if you use it at all, it's an extension. Uh, full text search. Uh, HStore, which is an awesome key value store inside Postgres, is an extension. Uh, we saw BloomFilter was an extension. So all these things that basically hook into the Postgres APIs and allow you to do more with Postgres while at the same time not changing the core of it. Um, so I'm going to highlight a few of these here. Um, a, a shameless kind of disclaimer, I work at Citus now. Um, I was actually playing with it long before I worked there. Um, so Citus is uh, one extension that's pretty interesting. Um, Postgres, as a rule of thumb, works best when all your data is in memory. So I'll talk about this kind of in a little bit about performance. Um, for most OLTP applications, basically Postgres is going to keep frequently accessed data in memory, um, and it's going to be a lot faster. As soon as you start to hit disk, performance is going to be crap. Um, what I've seen you know, with hundreds of thousands of databases is if you need to scale out, it's usually because you had one really large table. Um, nine times out of 10, uh, this is called events or logs or messages. Like if you have one of these tables, there's a chance it's consuming the bulk of your database. Um, and at some point, you basically have to say, OK, what do I do with this? How do I keep scaling? Because it's just not working. Um, there's a number of options, you know, Dynamo, Cassandra. Um, Citus is now another option, which basically takes your one single node Postgres and turns it into a distributed database. So think very similar to Parallel, but think across multiple machines. So the Postgres Parallel work, um, this is just applied the same idea to multiple machines. So uh, how do you get started with it? Basically, you run create extension Citus, just like all the other extensions. Uh, you create a table. Uh, let's call it tweets. And then I want to say, hey, I want to just uh, create this table as sharded um, at this point. So um, basically, create me a distributed table kind of in the metadata. Um, and then run this command to create all these shards. And so in this case, a shard is just another table under the covers, um, just a Postgres table. It's going to create a whole bunch of logical shards. So in this case, a logical shard is just a table that's distributed. From here, what we're going to do, um, that's going to automatically cascade to physical shards. So if you have like four different nodes, like Citus is going to take care of saying, OK, there's four nodes. Here kind of how we hash things across them. Uh, and then you just insert data. And it's basically going to look like one table up to your primary database. And then you're going to have a whole bunch of other tables that actually have the data. So because of Postgres extension APIs, you can hook directly into the query planner and say, rewrite this query and actually query all these other tables that are remote. Um, so pretty powerful stuff that we can now take stock Postgres, turn it in nice and distributed. Um, another one that I really love is Hyperloglog. -Log. As soon as this came out, I was super excited about it and kind of wished I worked in like a huge ad, ad network so that I could try it. Um, this is the formula for Hyperloglog. -Log. It's a formula, I believe, out of Google, I could be wrong about that, though. Um, so this is, in short, is what hyperloglog -log is. Um, you can read that as well as I can. Um, that may mean more to a lot of people in the room than it does to me. Um, I read it a few times, and this was my reaction. Um, like, I, I kind of got one of them. Like, K minimum value, kind of got that. And then after that, it's, OK, complete loss. Um, and it's, it's basically all of those things in one algorithm. Um, if you like papers, it's a fun paper to go read. Uh, here's a gross oversimplification of it, but it's basically like prob probabilistic uniques with a really small footprint. Um, to even simplify further, close enough counts. Like, it's really close. If you're doing a count across a billion, billions of things, I want to say, uh, roughly, how many do I have? It's pretty accurate. Um, it's pretty simple to do, um, and it gets really powerful in that I can start to do unique things across um, unique things across all of my uniques that I couldn't kind of easily do, which is a select count. Um, so you're going to just like other extensions, uh, do create extension HLL, and you're going to have this new data type. 
In this case, I'm going to call it users. So I'm going to have all of my daily uniques, and I'm going to have um, this users HLL. So to insert into this, I'm going to start uh, hashing user IDs. So all I'm going to, every day I'm going to hash my user as they log in that day and say insert them into this weird hash thing. Store them in this data type. Now what's interesting is now I can actually start to query across this. So let's say I have 100 unique people on Tuesday and 100 unique people on Wednesday. But how many unique people did I have on Tuesday and Wednesday? Um, so HLL has this crazy probabilistic thing under the covers. Um, really go read the paper if you want to. It's super interesting. Um, and fairly dense as well. But basically it says, okay, because of the way I hash these things, because of all this stuff that I'm using under the covers, I can say, oh, there were actually uh, 75, or no, it would be more no matter what. There were 125 people, uh, unique people on Tuesday and Wednesday. And I can do unions, I can do intersections, I can say, oh, 75 people were the same, that kind of thing. Uh, so pretty interesting overall in terms of if you're doing ad network stuff, if you're doing things where you need to give some estimates on how many people saw something or did something, uh, it usually gets you pretty close. Um, and so from here, you know, I can see I'm just going to extract the month. Um, I'm going to query the daily uniques, and I'm going to, in this case, do a union, and it's going to give me a union of a whole bunch of things. Uh, so extensions. I mentioned extensions are kind of the, the future of Postgres. It's got a really powerful API for extensions. There's a whole, whole lot of extensions. Um, there's one for hypothetical indexes. So what happens if I added this index to Postgres? Uh, would my performance actually get better? Um, Multicorn is one to allow you to write uh, foreign data wrappers in Python. So most foreign data wrappers are written uh, like at the C level for Postgres. Any one you want to use in production, you probably do want to use the actual C1 for performance. Uh, but Multicorn gives you a nice interface to kind of play around with it. It's kind of fun. Um, a whole bunch of things in here. Um, go explore uh, PG Extension Network um, if you search for it. Um, there's new ones every day. Uh, it's worth checking out and just kind of keeping an eye on those kind of things because it's where a lot of the uh, advances will come. Uh, so a few more things. Um, we've got a little bit of time. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit and talk a little bit more, just kind of like Postgres as an end user, Postgres before 9.5, that kind of thing. Um, so first, psql. I'm going to see if I can do this. Um, there we go. I'm so not going to be able to type this way. Command F1. Nope. Uh, I can swap it over this way. There we go. I lose my terminal as well. Oh no, here we go. Cool. Uh, so I'm connected to a database now. Um, how many people of you, so there are a lot of people that run Postgres. How many people are you uh, are active in psql on a regular basis? How many people use something else for interacting with your database normally? Most people? OK. Um, psql is wonderful and powerful. Um, so I'm just going to kind of run through a bunch of commands here, and then I'll kind of give a slide that summarizes a bunch of them. Uh, something that's super handy to have on is slash x auto. Um, I actually just turned it off. Uh, I'm going to query. Query something here. This, uh, this actually already looks pretty. So let me. Try to make it less pretty. There we go. Uh, so if I query this right now, it looks like this. Um, this isn't great output. Um, slash x auto is something that's super handy. Um, it'll automatically format based on the length of the kind of output of how it displays it. So if I rerun this query here, 
Um, you'll see I'm going to get ID over here, server over here, create edit over here. Um, really nice, pretty formatting. Um, I can uh, change this and let's say I just want to query um, ID from that table. Uh, it's going to give it in the other format. Um, I can add something in here and again it's not going to wrap it this time since it's shorter. Let's see what I can grab. Uh, oh. Helps if I have the right column. Uh, so for formatting output, this is really nice and simple. Uh, super handy as you basically just say, hey, I don't want to actually have to think about this. Let my terminal do the right thing. Um, you can also set up your default editor. Um, so mine is vim right here. Um, you can set this to be anything. Um, backslash e will open up the last query you ran, so you can make your queries actually in your preferred editor, whether it's Emacs, whether it's vim. Um, you can actually set up Sublime Text as well, which po pops open a new window. As soon as you close and save it, it'll automatically run that query. So super handy. Um, Setting up a psql rc actually is super handy for all of this. Um, if you use vim, you probably have a vim rc. Um, you, you probably customize your bash shell a little bit. Uh, this is what mine looks like. Uh, and it has a whole bunch of just standard things in here. So um, displaying null. So I actually know that there's a null in that column. It's kind of handy. Uh, timing. Every query I run, I don't know if you noticed it, every query I run had timing on by default. Did that query take one second or did it take uh, 10 seconds? Uh, it's nice to know. All of my history is actually saved inside this folder um, with uh, the database name. So I know what database I was connected to and every single command I've ever run against my database. Um, super handy to go back in time. Yeah, question? How does timing work? Is it running as you explain otherwise? Or? Uh, nope, it's a, just a simple kind of piece equal doing a, a timing. So. Um, we actually had it on up here, so you'll see right here. Um, it just says, here's the time. Um, so really nice and simple. Um, if you wanted, you could do something more verbose there. Um, you can basically do just about whatever you want in here. So I would say, like, if you think psql is super limited, um, it's probably because you haven't spent any time customizing it. Um, so it's worth spending a little bit of time, just like you would any other editor. Um, let's see. So a couple of those things, I think I just hit on all of them. Um, slash X auto is super handy for formatting your, uh, uh, the output of your text by default. Um, setting something up to null, um, that's an annoyance that, you know, when you look at a lot of data and query it and there's just something empty there, or maybe there's a rhyme, line wrap or something like that, um, being explicit that this is a null character is, is handy. Uh, timing, you could take or leave, but it, I find it's useful to have on. Um, and then saving all of your history. Um, if you ever like spend a while on a query and then come back to it to say, crap, I lost it, what happened? Um, it's pretty painful to write SQL already. Um, to write it and then have to rewrite it is kind of frustrating. So you should just go ahead and have your history there. Um, does, who here likes to write SQL? A couple hands. Who here likes to read someone else's SQL? <laughs> Anyone? Um, SQL, is, SQL is super powerful. Um, it's, it's great for what it is, but it's, in a way, it's a horrible language. Um, I'm pretty sure it's because most of us just write bad SQL. Um, one thing to make this massively easier is common table expressions. Anytime I write a query more than 10, um, 10 lines or so, I usually use a common table expression. So we saw this earlier with the upsert. Um, you may hear these commonly referred to as uh, with clauses as well. Um, but essentially what I'm doing right here um, is creating a view during the time that I'm running this query. So I'm saying, okay, I'm going to create this query down here below, um, kind of that, that top section, but in the parentheses right there. I'm creating that query, and I'm naming it ahead of time. And you can chain these together. So you can do a lot of building blocks. So anytime you have more than three joins at once, or you're writing a query that's more than, I would say, 10 lines, CTEs can make this much more reasonable. So I can chain together something that's a 100-line SQL file that you can actually parse, because you can say, oh, I'm doing this one or two joints here, then I'm building on top of it for the next one, then I'm building on top of it for the next one. 
um, just like you would with application code. Um, so I would say anytime you're writing you know, a long SQL uh, statement, use CTEs and people will appreciate you. They'll look at your long query and actually understand it and be able to parse it. Um, CTEs are a little bit of an optimization boundary. Um, they're not going to always be as fast. Postgres doesn't always optimize them in the same way it tries. It's not always perfect. So if you're putting something into production that has to be really, really high performant, fine. But in terms of reporting, I've found like the readability easily trumps any kind of performance loss that you have when someone can actually come in and understand what's happening. Uh, Postgres performance. Uh, I mentioned this a little bit. Um, Postgres is really good at keeping frequently accessed data in memory. Um, it's going to be better at it than you are. I know you think you know what you're doing. It's like, oh yeah, this should use an index, this shouldn't. Postgres is going to be better about it. Um, for most applications, you just need to pay attention to the uh, cache hit rate. Um, there's a super simple query to track this. Um, yeah, um, you don't actually have to worry about what the query's doing. Um, it's just handy to basically have this and run it every so often. Um, you can actually set in a psql rc and name a query. You can say like uh, select uh, show slow queries and name it as a query in psql and it'll just automatically run this query for you, which is pretty handy. Um, so this is going to give back something really simple and basically give you a percentage of what's your cache hit ratio. For most applications, uh, this is what you're aiming for, about 99%. Uh, you can do the same thing for indexes. Um, indexes kind of gives you a different view. So this is a little bit of a simpler of a table, uh, or a query rather. Um, but what we're going to do here is say, give me all the rows for my tables and how often when I queried that table uh, did I use a index. Um, so it's going to give you something like this. Like, I've got this events table, right? Um, I think that was one of my names of ones that's going to be really large um, and I might actually have to distribute in time. Um, it's has never had an index used on it, and it's 700,000 uh, records. Um, this was actually a real sample from like the Heroku dashboard. Um, I looked at this as an example, and I'm like, have you guys thought about adding an index? They're like, mm, things seem okay. Um, we went and added an index. Uh, performance went from like one second a page like load to um, on this query, it was more like 10 milliseconds pretty much every time. Um, so rules of thumb, right? Cache hit ratio, you want it 99% or higher. Uh, if that starts to drop the solution, find a bigger box, get more memory. Uh, it's pretty simple. As soon as you go from 99% to less, your performance is absolutely going to tank. Not going to go from like 10 milliseconds to 100, it's going to go like 10 milliseconds to multiple seconds a lot of the time. Um, it gets really bad really fast. Um, index hit rate, about 95% is kind of what you want. Um, and I would say the rule of thumb, if you've got a really small table, you don't necessarily need an index on it. It's easy to just grab it. Uh, but anytime you have more than 10,000 rows, it can usually be pretty helpful. Um, adding on to this, uh, I would say you want about 90% of your queries in a web application to execute in 10 milliseconds or less. Um, one to two in that maybe 100 millisecond if they're, kind of, they're doing a lot. Um, and if they're kind of doing anything more than that, uh, you're probably not building like a web application, it's kind of like BI, analytics, something completely different. Um, and forget the rules that I said, you're building something completely different. So I, I kind of flew through a lot of that. Um, just kind of recapping a good bit here. Um, Postgres came out just a few months ago, um, 9.5. I think it was actually three months ago and not four yet. Um, Upsert's great. If you're using a you know custom upsert today, go ahead and replace this with the real thing. Um, beyond that, it's just a whole bunch of small improvements. I encourage people to upgrade. It, it kind of makes life better in a day-to-day -day experience. Um, very similar in Postgres 9.6. Um, Postgres 9.6 is going to give you some good performance gains um, and improvements there. Uh, but other than that, it's going to be a lot of kind of small usability things again under the and then under the cover improvements. Um, and as I mentioned, extensions. Uh, go check out uh, pgxn.org, search for Postgres extensions. Uh, you'll find the website. Uh, this is really where a lot of the future is going to be at. Um, PostGIS has been one for a while, um, but there's more and more. There's Citus for distributing data, Hyperlog Log that does crazy things that I don't really understand, but it's interesting. 
um, hypothetical uh, indexes is a really awesome one that it's on my list to play with, but I haven't been too hands-on with it yet. Um, so that's kind of the, the quick recap. Um, again, if I, I probably missed a number of things on here. Like, go take a look at these. Um, if there's something on here you don't recognize, just pull up the docs, search for it. There's probably a good blog post on it. Um, yeah, so for anyone that's not using Postgres, hopefully you're a little one over, and hopefully there was a little bit of something in there for uh, even those that have been using it quite a bit. Uh, cool, thank you, and I'll answer any questions if people have them. Uh, so the question was, when, uh, in Citus, when you start a table and you join, what happens? Uh, the answer is it depends. Um, so if it's like uh, join co-located, so a lot of the times it kind of depends on the use case, right? If you can shard that same data um, that you're joining against, you can basically push down that join and it all happen at the sharded level. Um, if you're doing something like a broadcast join, that it's a whole bunch of things that roll back up together, that works fine. Um, complications uh, come when you're querying from one shard and you want to join on another shard in like an isolation sense. Um, distributed systems are still hard. Um, so uh, today that's not supported out of the box. There's some roadmap for it. Um, and there's some workarounds for it. So there's kind of some ways to kind of work around that. So it, it really kind of depends on what kind of join you're looking to do is the, is the short answer. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the question was, uh, in basically like foreign data wrappers and foreign schemas, how does the type mapping work? Um, it depends on the foreign data wrapper. So Postgres is pretty like broad in its support of types. So um, it's more dependent on the other system, right? So uh, Redis is a key value store. Um, for the Redis foreign data wrapper, it just says, oh, everything's uh, a varchar, and if you want to convert it, you can't. Um, that's what the Redis one does. Um, Mongo, I think, has a little more support for various data types. Um, the Postgres one, you have full support. Uh, MySQL, right? Pretty broad support for different data types. So it depends case by case on the, the foreign data wrapper that you're looking at. Yep. Uh, does Citus, after you create a set number of shards, can you change that number of shards without taking the table offline? Yeah, so the question is for Citus, if you create a set number of shards, can you change the number of shards without taking everything online? Uh, you can. So there's two ways to do that today. Um, one is kind of up on your own, and then there's an enterprise kind of version of Citus which has a rebalancer. So it keeps all the metadata about which things are where, and it'll basically rebalance that online, and then kind of like, it depends if you're scaling down or scaling up, right? Um, but basically, it knows how the, to rebalance the shard. Um, and part of that is Citus runs with the ability to control a replication factor. So it can write data to multiple shards, so it's easy to kind of kill them off. Um, the short is, yeah, there's an enterprise kind of library to help with that. Um, and then on the cloud side, we have that out of the box as well. Cool. Yep. Um, so as you mentioned, Postgres is a relatively old code It's two decades old and it's big. Uh, how come and what kind of methods, techniques are used in order to still be able to add so many features at each release? Yeah, so uh, the question was like, Postgres is old <laughs> um, and a big code base. It has it basically keep any sort of momentum and um, how is it kind of maintained? Um, I guess, is that a fair enough kind of rephrasing of it? Yeah, I mean, I would really like to understand uh, specific techniques that are used. Like, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's not a unit test because it's C, so. Yeah, so um, Postgres is a really good code base. Um, we were talking about this earlier. Um, it's a it's a nice C code base. It's one of the nicer C code bases out there. Um, contributing to Postgres does take a little bit. I think you look and like you don't just jump in and, and submit uh, pull requests like you do to other frameworks. Um, there's a little bit of a higher barrier of entry there. Um, so a lot of the core developers um, have a big part of that. Um, Postgres internally has an interesting kind of community where there is. Um, Postgres core developers, then there's major contributors, then there's minor contributors, and there's essentially only seven people that have a commitment to Postgres. Um, so it's pretty limited overall. Um, now, major contributors usually get a little more leeway and have, you know, 
Um, their patch is not reviewed quite as in-depth um, versus a you know, minor contributor getting a more thorough review and having more people kind of have oversight. Um, in general, it is a really good code base. That helps a lot. Um, but I think part of it is, and this is kind of the, the theme I tried to hit on, is the extensions, right? By exposing more kind of the APIs and allowing more hooks, they don't have to put as much in the code base. I think they are feeling some of that pain of like, if we have to keep adding everything, we have only have seven people. And the amount of kind of functionality, um, PostGIS is a great example. I don't know if any of the core committers um, actively use PostGIS. Um, that's almost a completely separate community. So if that had to live in core, um, turn around on those kind of things and new changes would be really hard. Yeah, I think generally it's, it's socially, I, there's no magic sauce there of like, how do we do some amazing testing stuff? Yep. You talked about how parallel scans can speed up uh, big table scanning. Um, would that not, if you're scanning a big table, would that not come down to disk speed and could a single process not already use up all of your disk data? Yeah, so the question is like, uh, in parallel scans, uh, Essentially, wouldn't it just come down to disk speed? And at that point, isn't that going to consume everything? Um, it, it depends. I think it really depends on case by case. Um, if you're on, and I think a lot of people, depending on the workload, if you're on some solid state drives, you can do some interesting things there. Um, so it really depends on the disk configuration. Um, if you're on a classic spinning uh, disk, yeah, probably. Um, but I think if you look at some of the more interesting configurations that people run with these days, um, there are cases where it still does show really nice performance gains. Yep. Uh, just follow up on this text, but really interesting to hear. And my question is the following. Um, when we get data from a uh, NoSQL database, in JSON it's not like <coughs> the uh, document, because it might be the case some values are in, in one document, some values are not in this document. Uh, what would happen if we just, let's say, try to access some value where it's not existing? Yeah, so the question is, like, if you're, I think, using, like, the Mongo foreign data wrapper to query, like, a NoSQL database um, and looking for some key that's not there, what happens? Um, my suspicion is it would just, I'm not 100% sure here. Uh, my suspicion is it would just say, hey, it's not there, I don't know what to do, right? Like, not found. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, part of that is it's probably going to be pulled up automatically, though, into the application layer. So usually when you're looking at a foreign data wrapper like that, um, you're not doing some weird manipulation down inside the data, at least when you're talking about like the Mongo or Redis one. Um, but I'm not 100% sure one. Um, I know uh, Stripe has used uh, the Mongo one before. I don't know if they still use it in production today. Um, but I don't know too many people that have uh, used it. Um, so yeah, I'm not 100% sure, sure in that case. Uh, yeah, so the question is basically, like, can you go the other way? I, I don't know. I think there's been some projects, but nothing quite as big and interesting as the Postgres foreign data wrappers. Um, SQL Server may have some support. Um, for the most part, though, I don't see most people saying, I have data in Postgres and I want it in Mongo. Um, like, SQL is what people expect to talk, and Postgres has SQL. Um, so if you're looking at doing analytics, like, usually it's going the other way. So I haven't seen many examples of it. Um, there may exist some, but I'm not sure of any right off. Okay, yep. yep. One last question, sorry. Uh, this is a general one, it's not specific to Postgres, but do you think SQL is a good query language? Uh, do I think SQL is a good query language? Yes, yeah, I mean, for, for what it is, right? As a query language. Um, if, if you look at where its roots are in, like, um, uh, relational algebra, relational calculus, I think, you know, it's a good representation of what it is. I think there's some things that are horribly wrong. I think if you look at other languages, um, and I could probably rant about this for a while, like, um, you should probably start with the from clause. Everything else does. In every other language, you say, what's kind of the collection you're pulling something from? Now let me filter things out of it. So SQL is just unintuitive in that sense. Um, but the primitives of uh, relational algebra and calculus are pretty sound. Um, so in that sense, yes, there are some things about it that are odd, but uh, overall for what it is as a reporting language, it's really powerful, right? 
Uh, I think most of the time when we're building a web application, we're not looking at it from a reporting perspective. So like something like inserts and updates are really simple there and kind of annoying, but it, like when it comes to reporting, it is it is a pretty good language there. So have you seen anything that's, um, that might close, come close to the place in SQL or being a to like this expression as well? I, I, I haven't seen anything come close to replacing SQL yet. I think if we look at a macro trend, um, and here it's totally speculating, right? But like a macro trend in the industry is everyone actually um, rebuilding a SQL-like thing on top of a thing that didn't have SQL before. Um, so I think SQL is pretty well run, run in that respect. Um, you look at you look at Cassandra, you look at all of these other databases which didn't have that before, and now they're building things like their own query language that looks very SQL-like but isn't quite SQL on top now. Cool. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to stick around for more questions if anyone has them. But uh, yeah, thanks a lot. People get to more beer and pizza. <laughs>